So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Emilio Lorenzo. I'm the Associate Director of Employer Relations for NSU. Uh, what that means is my role is really to develop jobs, internships, and opportunities for students and alumni while they're in school or when they graduate, um, and really giving them an edge in their own career by giving them guidance on the workforce, employer trends, or even sending referrals on their behalf. Uh, today, we have a great topic. We're going to be talking about job and internship searching techniques. So right in my wheelhouse, um, I'm making this very specific uh, to CRDS students because that's the major you're in. Um, and I want to make sure that the resources I provide and the guidance I provide are really unique to your population. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation or um, you know, anything I'm covering you'd like to know more, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. I, I'm, I'm very casual when it comes to that, and I really want to make sure that um, if you have a question, it's probably a question someone else in the audience may have. So a lot to cover today. Um, we're going to be going over not just the techniques, but I'm going to be talking about the Center for Academic and Professional Success. That's the office I'm a part of. Um, we have a lot of resources and services available to you. I'm going to talk about my role in providing services to you, but also the office as a whole. And the great thing about it is these services are available to you no matter how many years you graduate from now. So many universities, after you graduate, they charge you for career or these type of services. Um, for us, it's free of charge and something we provide to you. I'm going to talk about the job search where you begin in terms of benchmarking and self-assessment. Many people think that you start job and internship searching just by applying, and that's usually not the best way of going about it. So we're gonna talk about how to self-assess, how do you benchmark so you can make sure that you're a strong candidate and you know how to sell yourself in that process. Then we're gonna talk about different resources, search engines, portals, Things specific to writing, journalism, nonprofits, the arts, media, graphic design, um, and what's out there. Then we're going to have a little bit of tips on resume and cover letter writing, how to stay organized in your job search so that you know if you get a call from an employer who's actually calling you, what you've applied for, and you're tracking your applications. We're going to talk about the proactive approach to the job search and the power of networking. 80% of the jobs we find are through word of mouth and through networking. So we're going to talk about how to leverage that effectively. A few tips on interviews and then wrapping it up with some salary negotiation resources. So again, a lot to unpack today, but all this information is for you. And although it's done in a presentation format, there's ways that we can give you this information specifically one-on-one. -on -one. So our office, the Center for Academic and Professional Success, we're located in the Horvitz building. We have career advisors on hand that can support you in building an individualized game plan. It's not cookie cutter. The first time you meet with the advisor, they ask you questions. What's your program in? What are your long-term goals? What are the experiences you have? What do you care about? Where do you, can you see yourself? So it's very individualized, our approach to the job and internship search. They can coach you on some of the resources I'm providing you today. They can connect you back to myself, who is the one that's working with the hiring managers and recruiters. They can help you develop a targeted resume, CV, or cover letter. And that's super important because if you're applying even to the same industry, graphic design or media positions or marketing positions, communication positions with PR companies, you can't use the same resume for every job and internship. Sometimes you don't need to make many tweaks, if at all. But sometimes these little tweaks or big overhauls can go a long way to getting the attention of hiring managers because at the end of the day, hiring managers only look at a resume for about 15 seconds. That's a short amount of time to get someone's attention. So we need to be strategic with our language and how we're marketing ourselves. Other CAP services, we can do mock interviews with you specific to jobs or um, your industry. We can help you take project work from the classroom and help, it, help you add it to your professional documents or portfolio. We can help you explore your career and where you want to go from now. Strategic action planning, what you should be doing first, how you should be going applying, how you should organize yourself. 
talk to you about strategies in networking, whether that's in person or in a virtual space, career fairs, and then also giving you tips and tools for your salary negotiations, making sure that you know how to deal with those difficult conversations, but how to avoid bringing that up too soon in the process. And also we can help you with your LinkedIn and personal branding. So LinkedIn is a great tool I'm gonna to be talking about. We could actually help you build that from scratch uh, in our office. So first I wanted to introduce you to the employer relations team. So we are part of the CAPS office and we primarily work with the employers. We develop the jobs, the internships, the experiences you need while you're in school and then connecting you with the right employers when you graduate. We host a variety of different employer events, career fairs, employer information sessions, workshops, just like I'm leading today. Um, myself, I'm the associate director. My counterpart, Naima Butler, she's the assistant director. And then we have a graduate assistant, Cameron Wallace. All three of us work together and we work in collaboration with our advising team who do a lot of the heavy lifting of meeting with students individually. Now, what do we do as an ER team? We proactively build relationships. We host about nine career fairs a semester. We do information session with employers, panel discussions, visits. Um, you know, prior to COVID, we did a lot more of those visits. On-campus interview or virtual interviews. Uh, we do resume books organized by industry. So if you put your name in the res or your resume in the resume book, and an employer is having trouble filling that position. Your resume, your resume is automatically sent to these employers. We do monthly newsletters. So we have newsletters specific for graduate students. We have uh, newsletters for each industry and all of it is housed on Handshake, which I'm gonna be talking about. Now, the, one of the advantages of working with us is referrals. So, and some on the call, I've actually sent referrals on your behalf already. But you can always, let's say you're applying to jobs or internships and you're not hearing back or you're hearing back, but you want a competitive advantage. You can always send myself or Naima referrals that we can send on your behalf. All you would need to do is submit your resume or, and or cover letter. It's always best to include a cover letter, the link to the position and the name of the company. And what we do is you send us that information we look at our employer database and we find a contact we may have there and we send a referral on your behalf. If you have a cover letter, there's more we can mention as to why you're a good fit for the position. And so that extra recommendation or referral might give you a chance to get that interview. It doesn't guarantee you the job or internship, but it's that extra nudge to that employer like, hey, if you haven't taken a look at this applicant, here's someone that might be a good fit. Now, before sending the referral, you want to officially apply to the position because when we send that referral, they're going to look in their HR pool or the, the pool of applicants as a whole and trying to see where your name pops up. Even though we're going to attach your documents, they still want that official application in there. But that's that little extra that we can do to really support you in the job and internship search. Now, CAPS also hosts a variety of other events. All of them are housed on Handshake. We do events such as resume building, cover letter building, how to network, how to build your LinkedIn, building your brand. Um, I've mentioned some of the events we hosted. We had about nine fairs in March that were organized by industry. Uh, they're known as Recruit a Shark events. Um, and we've done different events, case competitions, on-campus interviews, et cetera. Now, one of our main database, our main database, and it's our one-stop shop for career, is known as Handshake. Each of you have a Handshake account already because it's the same username and password that you use for Shark Mail, Shark Link. It's a one sign-in system. This is where we push all of our employers to post jobs and internships, events, external career fairs, workshops. So if you haven't done so already, the link's at the bottom there, nova.joinhandshake.com. Um, and again, you go in there, there's sample resumes, sample cover letters, and it's not just a local job and internship search. 
This is the main platform used by majority of universities across the country, and we share employers. So employers like Facebook that are posting in the West Coast, these positions are also active on ours. So it's not just a local job search and internship, it's nationwide. And it keeps you informed on not just internal events that my team is hosting, but everyone, other employers can post and promote. We also send spotlights through there on positions we see available. But the great thing is you can send us referrals whether they're on Handshake or not. But if you see it on Handshake, you'll know that we have a really good relationship with that company. So again, you can send us referrals for positions you find on LinkedIn or on another site. But Handshake is a platform where you have so many different resources, guides to interviews, resumes, cover letters, events, and then again, the opportunities themselves. Now, there's a lot of ways that we get this information out there. So uh, we send monthly about 10 different newsletters. Uh, one of them that you've been receiving is our How Most Graduate newsletter. And there's a specific section for CRDM in there that has writing positions, media, graphic design. All of our newsletters are also housed on Handshake. So if you're looking in your email box and you can't find it, all you have to do is log into Handshake, go to resources, and there's a specific section of newsletters which lists the last three months worth of newsletters. We also send regional newsletters out. So although our newsletters feature opportunities all across the country, uh, once a semester, we send a newsletter specific for the Northeast, specific for the West Coast, Midwest, Southeast, and then one dedicated to just research opportunities. Um, but these are all available to you. And separate from that, and you've probably seen emails of this, employer spotlights. If I see a great opportunities in graphic design or marketing or communications, and that employer's needing candidates, you'll get an email from Handshake with that position and that company's information, and that's inviting you to apply. So the newsletter just lists them all, where that spotlight, I'm really promoting one specific opportunity with the company. Um, and so these are three ways that we really try to get the word out. Um, but again, we're happy to send anything on your behalf directly to employers. So where do you begin? That we started off talking about the resources, handshake, but where do you start with your job and internship? And it starts by asking yourself some questions. What are your interests? What are your skills? What are your strengths? Where do you see yourself three to five years down the line? What are your short and long-term goals? Where do you want to end up? Do you want to run a media team? Do you want to work in the movie industry, graphic design, teaching, education, marketing, communications firm? You need to start answering these for yourself and more than just the basics. You need to be able to show it with passion because guess what? When you apply, you get called for an interview. The whole goal of an interview is to get the interviewer excited about your applicancy. How can you do that if you haven't really digested that information for yourself and be able to vocalize it? Telling your friends, your family, be able to answer the question as to the whys that led to this industry and then the where. Where can I do it? What's, what's the work environment that I want to be a part of? Do I want to work like in a startup company, a fun culture, a diverse culture, a, a culture that maybe isn't going to micromanage me, you know, one that I'm going to be able to be creative or working for a company that's going to make a difference outside of that I get to do the skills I'm, you know, I've developed. I'm doing it for a company that I feel like I'm making a difference. And you need to start by doing that by benchmarking profiles on LinkedIn. If you can see yourself becoming a media manager, a communication specialist, whichever you, you, that is in your interest, look up the LinkedIn profiles of people that are in positions in there already. Look at their LinkedIn profile. Look at the almost the thread of what led them to that point. That's almost a roadmap, not just on how to reach those goals, but if you do, let's say, five to seven profiles, and you notice that all five to seven profiles have X, Y, and Z skill set or experience all in similar areas, that should be a green light for you on, that's something I need to develop. That's something I need to get involved in. 
identify your strengths, your gaps. It's okay to identify your weaknesses or things that you don't have. There's plenty of time to develop that. But also looking at these roadmaps, you might see that there's not just one road to your goal. You might see people that have ended up in positions you can see yourself in, but maybe they started in the education industry. Some that worked in marketing firms before, some that worked for nonprofits before. There's not just one road to our goals, but when we break it down to the bare bones of skills, we start seeing that there's a common thread or common theme in these skill sets. And that's what we need to focus on. How can we build these skills? Also know your non-negotiables. We all have different values. You know, our personality, our interests, a lot of things change over the years on who we are as an individual. But our values, some a lot of times don't fluctuate so much. Like you don't wake up one day and say, you know what? I don't even want to help people no more. It's like, no, that doesn't happen. You what what can fluctuate is the order of those values. For example, you might have a lot of family in South Florida. And one of the things that you value is location. You're like, you know what? I'd be willing to take a position that maybe isn't as higher paying, but can keep me in the South Florida area. Uh, or some things you're like, I really want to work for a company that I'm going to make a difference. Or I want a certain salary. I want a certain location. There's a lot of things that you can value. Know your non-negotiable. Because sometimes when you do sacrifice your values for something, that's when you become very unhappy in the job. And when you go into a job, you ideally want to stay there for a year to three years so that you can have that growth and you don't have red flags on your resume that shows that you're a job hopper going from one job to the other. And so identifying your non-negotiables early on, it also can prepare you for the interview because when you're interviewed for an opportunity, they're not just interviewing you, you're interviewing them and you're evaluating them. It's not just if they make me an offer, I'll accept it. You're evaluating them. They may not all be the right fit. And if they have a lot of turnover, there's a red flag there as to why they're having that turnover. How are they treating their employees? And it might be a good position, but is it the right position for you? Now, so before the job search is also about organizing. Create a job search checklist. You know, what are keywords you're going to be using? What are your non-negotiables? Make a hit list of companies. I always say hit lists aren't just for assassins. They're also for you in your job search. So make a hit list of local companies or companies in the area you're thinking about. And these are simple Google searches. If you know, hey, I want to work for a PR for a communication company, a nonprofit, you can easily pull a list of nonprofits or PR firms in that area. Yeah, it takes more work. I would tell you, job searching is a job on its own. It's going to take time. You should, just like your study schedule, allocate time to do the heavy lifting of this because jobs aren't just going to magically appear. Even these newsletters I send out, these opportunities I send out, don't just rely on them. Do a targeted search by making these checklists for yourself. Also, by starting early, you can identify gaps in skills. If you're like, man, all the positions I want, they want someone that's very savvy with Excel. Well, between now and when you graduate or between now and when you apply, there's ways of developing that. LinkedIn learning or taking a position that might not ask for such high level Excel skills, but give you exposure to grow that skill set or give you exposure to Illustrator or developing other graphic design skills. You need to also understand that there's not just one setting where you can use these skills. You need to start thinking, what are other work settings in my industry so that you can open up where and when I could be able to find an opportunity? And defining your goals through self-reflection and self-assessment, talking to your mentor, talking to your faculty, doing research and having educated conversations, doing informational interviews with people in your industry. Yeah, that's how I got into my own industry. Over 10 years ago, I discovered career advising and I decided to do an informational interview with, at the time, director of our office who was overseeing an advisement team. And it not only taught me more about my in, the industry I wanted to get into, it got me more excited, 
But now I built a contact with someone that was in my industry and had hiring, uh, hiring power. And although it didn't lead to a job right then and there, a few months later, an opportunity opened up and I applied. And guess what? I wasn't just another number on the paper. So building relationships as you benchmark, especially before there's a job on the line, can go a long way to really building a bridge or planting a seed that can pay dividends down the road. So part of your benchmarking, and this should be an exercise you guys all do, I want you to pull five to six job descriptions in an area that you want to apply for, whether it's at the end of this year, in the next few months, pull those job descriptions. And I want you to have in one side your resume, on the other side, the job descriptions. Read all five to six job descriptions. And then on a blank piece of paper or on the blank side of your resume, I want you to think if you are the hiring manager for these jobs, what are the key skills, knowledge, abilities, and intangibles you would be looking for? Knowledge on Illustrator, experience in communication, great teamwork skills, et cetera, et cetera. Write them all down. I then want you to go into your resume, and I mentioned they only read your resume for about 15 seconds. I'm going to give you a full five minutes. You then go in through your resume, and for every skill that you identified or knowledge or anything you did, put a little check mark next to it every time your resume highlights it. At the end of this exercise, look at that whole list that you wrote down in the, as a hiring manager. Is everything checked off? If not, would you have hired yourself for the job? And the things that you're missing, are there avenues to develop them, to, meet, to kind of have them? And so it's important to know this because it not only shows where your resume maybe is cutting yourself short, but it's also letting you know what you need to be doing between now and actually the job search to develop the necessary skills to be competitive in the job market. So. Once you do that, developing a game plan from there on how you can build those skills and knowledge bases. So the game plan, developing your cover letter and resume, prepare for the interview, understand the strategies in the job search. You know, when you uh, look at a job description and it's very detailed, you should try to put it in a word cloud. Um, a lot of times it will tell you some of the action verbs or key adjectives they're using in that job description. Try to mirror some of those job, those words. If, they're, if you're using the word helped on your resume and they keep using the word advocated, use the word advocated. Many times in applications, especially with big companies, it, before it even gets to hiring manager, it gets put in a computerized system that is looking for certain keywords knowledge or anything. And so mirroring the job description can go a long way to getting through that first line of defense in the evaluation period. Some other offers, I mentioned referrals from our ER team, industry resume books. And if you don't have a lot of experience in the field, even if you do, leveraging the projects from your academic class into the uh, resume itself. Whether you got paid for an experience or not doesn't matter. What the company cares about is, can you do the job? Do you have the skills for the job? And many times, either in mock scenarios or in activities, you are asked to do tasks that would be very similar to what you would be asked if you went into the job. So make sure that you add these to your resume because they're huge selling points. And then identify avenues on where you could be proactive in the job search. So I mentioned about skill gaps. Here are just a variety of different websites that provide either free or minimal payment for students on trainings. Like, for example, as a student through the Alvin Sherman Library, you have free access to LinkedIn Learning. You can literally become an expert on Excel without paying a dime. And so there's a lot of tools in these that can help you develop either technical knowledge, hard skills, or even soft skills you need in the job search. So let's talk about the job and internship search. We've now talked about self-assessing and benchmarking, CAPS resources, handshake. 
Now, where do I go to find the jobs and internships? The first stop should be, well, Handshake should be your first stop because we have a ton of resources there. But I would say number two would be LinkedIn because LinkedIn allows you not only benchmark profiles, but there's a lot of jobs. There's a lot of professional organizations, companies that are very active there. So that's another avenue for you to search for jobs, follow industry experts, stay up to date on trends, join groups that have similar career interests as yourself. Another avenue, and this is more for when you graduate, NSU Connect. NSU Connect is like the alumni board. And so other alumni fellow sharks that have graduated are either promoting jobs, are talking about their companies. It's a way to be able to network and stay informed. Now, some other search portals outside of Handshake and LinkedIn. You know, career builder is not my favorite, but I like to mention everything because you never know which search is going to pull up what information. But career builder, Chug internships, it used to be called internships.com. I've mentioned Handshake, mentioned LinkedIn, Glassdoor, Indeed, The Muse. These are just a few in there. Now, specific to your industry, I have a few others now. Google searching, I know it seems simple, but sometimes you pull up a Google search. Companies sometimes are lazy and sometimes they don't want to post on all these sites. Doing a simple Google search might pull up a company's HR page that they've only posted it there. If you want to work in the government sector, USA Jobs. But the rest of these have opportunities that are directly aligned with either media, journalism, uh, nonprofit work, higher education the movie industry, you know, anywhere from Design Observer, which is a more on the graphic design side, PR news, artjobs.com, mediajobs.com, Media Bistro, not, Nonprofit Career Network, Journalism crof, Crossing, or if you want to work in the higher ed industry, higheredjobs.com is a great website to find all of those there. These, in combination with Handshake, LinkedIn, Indeed, Glassdoor, you have so much to search for. But in addition to that, again, going back to your hit list, know what companies are in your area that you are interested in. Because outside of just going and applying through these search engines, you should be going to company-specific HR pages. So these are just a few ways that you can find opportunities in your specific industry. Now, let's say you're already working in a company or you want to network and see what options are available. Uh, GoGig is an anonymous job search. It's free. When you come in there, it, asks you, it has you take a pretty long assessment. And that's just to know which area, industry, what skills you're looking for. And then it connects you with hiring managers that also are looking for those same things. But it's great because you don't have to disclose your name until you're ready, that you're a good match for an opportunity. And this is a way of it keeping it confidential if you don't really want to make your job search public. But even if you are not trying to be private, this is a great way of connecting with hiring managers that kind of match you up based on skill and fit. Now, as you're job searching, maybe you want to build your skill sets or you want to participate in what I call micro internships. So an internship is like a whole semester. A micro internship might be as short as one week. And a lot of times for those that have skills in writing, graphic design, media, um, editorial skills, there is a lot of companies that have need. They, not be, they may not be hiring for a full you know, position or internship, but they may pay you just for one project. And so this is a good way that as you're job searching, instead of having a gap of employment, you can keep getting financial income and also building your resume by participating in these micro projects, micro internships. They're all paid. Um, and you can find it on parkerdewey.com, which is a great resource to find kind of those short-term projects. Now, all these resources are great, and we've mentioned over like 20 search engines, but organizing your search is just as important as finding the opportunities. Because if you apply to, let's say, 10 positions one week, 
another five the next week, another 10 the next week, and then another 20. And then they start calling you. The worst thing you could say on that phone call is, who are you and what did I apply for again? No company wants to hear that. So you need to track and organize your search so that you know who and where you apply. And for everything you apply for, you should save the job description on your computer, your iPad, what have you. Because what happens is by the time you got called for an interview, they may have taken down that posting. And now you're gonna have to try to remember what was that in that job description so that you can be ready for the interview as opposed to saving the job description. So then all you have to do is like pull up that posting. And then as you're getting ready for the interview, you have that job description as almost a roadmap for yourself to prepare. Now staying organized also allows you to understand when should I follow up with the employer? You should always follow up seven to 10, seven to 14 business days after you apply. Don't, not being too pushy, you're just checking in to see the timeline for the hiring process. And in the next slide, I have an example of what an Excel spreadsheet would look like to stay organized in the job search, like name of company, title of position, the date that you applied, any contact information that you provided, a referral. So if you sent a referral to me that I can advocate on your behalf, checking in with me after that, um, follow up and thank you letter sent, and then the date that you plan to follow up with them. Now, if you've, let's say, exhausted all these search engines, you've gotten referrals and you're still struggling, sometimes it's beneficial to have an employment agency, you know, these third-party recruiters. They're not my favorite, and I would say you only want to do it, you know, break glass in case of emergency. And you want to make sure that you avoid any agency that requires a fee before job placement. And you want to know what you're agreeing to, because sometimes these agencies will ask for a percentage of your salary once you're placed. So you need to know what you're agreeing for before you work with them and take everything in stride. They may want you to rehaul your resume or things like that. You need to be strategic and make sure that your resume is marketing yourself effectively. And you need to know what this employment agency is actually going to offer you in terms of connection. But this is just if you're having struggle and you've utilized all these other things that we've talked about. So recap, handshake, LinkedIn, search engines, self-assessing our job search, organizing our job search. But the, the way that we market ourselves in the job search is our resume. It's our marketing tool. It's what tells the employer in the basic level, why we're the right fit. It doesn't get us the job. It gets us the interview for the job or internship. Now, you might hear the word resume or CV used interchangeably. Really, CV stands for curriculum vita. That's, you know, the only difference between a resume and a CV is a CV is much more extensive. So where a resume is one to two pages, a CV can go past two pages. You only really need a CV if you're at the doctorate level, like you're a faculty member, you have 10 plus years of experience, you have publications, you have all these things. If not, you really should be having a one to two page CV. And that's where working with an advisor can be strategic because you want to make sure that your resume, if it can be in one page, that we do it, that it's visibly appealing, that we're avoiding certain. Microsoft templates, HR managers and organizations, they hate templates. They don't want to see it. And so we need to be strategic as to how we're bolding, how we're italicizing, how we're highlighting information on there. Um, and so really want to give you the difference between those. But resume needs to balance between being strategic, short and easy to read without it being too wordy and maybe not using the keywords that you're supposed to be using. So there's three pieces I'm going to be talking a lot about, content, format, and style. So the content is what we include in there, our experiences, our skill sets, our projects. The format is kind of how we organize the information, the font style, the placement. The style 
is the bolding, italicizing, underlining, the margins, how we spread that information out so it's easy to find and read. So as you set up your resume, some things that you should keep in mind is make the margins a 0.5 all around, avoid any templates. You don't need to include your picture in it unless it's like an international job. They usually don't want your picture included. You should keep your font size anywhere between a 10 to 12.5. Be consistent with your, if you're gonna use Times Roman, Calibri, just don't be bouncing around different font styles. Remember, they're not trying to be impressed with the font style you chose. Make sure you include a link to your portfolio if you're a graphic designer or it's design or things that you want to show examples of your work. Balancing the spacing on the document, spreading the information out. And again, rule of thumb, keeping it to one to two pages. So at the top, you want to put your contact information. So this is where you put your name. So if the whole document is anywhere from 10 to 12 point font, make sure your name is a little bit bigger. It's like an 18 to 20 point font. You don't have to put your full address. They don't need to know your apartment number. All they need is the city, state, and maybe zip code. So they know if you're a local applicant. A recommendation is, I know right now you're going to school in Fort Lauderdale, but let's say your hometown is in New York, California. And that's where you're job searching. If you have a family or local address over there, I would recommend putting that local address as you job search, even if you haven't moved back fully yet. Because many times in those cities, major cities, New York, California, they're looking for local applicants. And so by having a local address, it gives you a little bit of a strategic advantage there. You can also, again, put a link to your LinkedIn URL to your LinkedIn profile or your portfolio in there. Now, some potential headings, professional experiences, but I prefer breaking this up. Like, for example, if you're applying to a graphic design internship or job and you already have experience in that field, group them together in a title that's called graphic design experience or communication and journalism experience writing and education experience, <clears throat> organize it by industry. Because if you just put work experience or professional experience, it goes back to they're only reading your resume for about 15 seconds. So if they spend two seconds reading professional experience, they don't know anything else yet. They have to read your experience to realize, oh, this person worked in education before. Oh, they do have some experience in communication, marketing, social media, et cetera, as opposed to using targeted headings, where if I see communication, social media, and design experience, as a hiring manager looking for that, I might be more excited about it, or I might be interested to read more. And it's already given me a heads up that you have experience in those specific areas. So... Professional experience is a broad umbrella that we can further break it up. Now, publications, presentations, professional organizations or affiliation, key skills, and you should make sure that the key skills are like specific, like if Illustrator or Canva, or if there's specific hard skills that the job is asking for, tweak those key skills based on what they're asking for. Relevant projects, which we're going to talk about. And again, if they're specific to your industry, call them communications projects, media projects, writing projects. Again, the company doesn't care if you got paid or not. What you're focusing on is the skills and knowledge you used in that project that can be relevant to the job you're applying for. Awards, community service, and again, coursework that might be relevant to them. So the first heading, education, and this sets the tone for the rest of the document. Let's pay attention to the structure and format, how we're starting from the most recent experience working backwards, and we're using bolding and italicizing strategically. So for example, for our section headings, we shouldn't bold them because they're just like guide, guide points. Instead, we should put our section headings in all capital letters and underline, 
and align them with the left margin. So that way it stands out, but it's not what my eyes are focused on. When you look at this, the first thing your eyes catch is your actual master's degree, your bachelor's degree. And that's the goal. Putting the most relevant information in bold, the secondary information in italics. So for education, we're bolding the degree, we're italicizing the institution. On the right-hand side, we're putting the graduation dates and the city and state. So it's easy for me to go left to right, left to right. I mentioned they're reading it for 15 seconds, but these hiring managers have been taught to skim and find the information they need quickly. <clears throat> Let's say you're going into communication and graphic design and you already have some experience there. What you can do is again, put the section heading in all capitalizations and underline. You bolt either the company or position based on what you feel is most relevant. For this one, there was the position. So you bold it, social media and creative marketing intern. On the right-hand side, you put the dates that you did that for. Underneath that in the, the you know, you put the name of the company and you italicize it. On the, and then you put your bullet points, starting with action verbs. Being specific, if you use social media channels, which channels did you use? What were some of the outcomes of the projects? What were the things that you did? Look at this. You know, it's being specific with what you're trying to say and what you're trying to get across to that company. And so this is just a way of organizing that information. It's the same thing for academic projects. When you mention the project, again, creating a catchy title. So composition, writing, and digital media projects. Put the name of the project, but make sure that that is clear for that company. Like, for example, magazine design project or communication strategies project. Even if that wasn't the exact title of the assignment, something that a hiring manager can understand or jump to conclusion as to what you're trying to get across. Put the dates on the right-hand side. You could put the name of the course that you took for that, and then NSU, and then Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It could also not be from the classroom. It could have been a writing competition, a, a media case competition, et cetera. And then your bullet points. In my office, we call these bullet points PAR statements. That's just like the three components you want in a bullet point, the project, the action, and result. You want to start with strong action verbs edited, designed, created, um, motivated, managed, edited, putting the skills in there. But for projects, you wanna make sure you're clear as to what this assignment was as it relates to the company itself. Some do's and don'ts for resumes, keeping it to one to two pages, using bolding and italicizing, including your project work, being specific on the skill sets, using targeted headings, and some don'ts. The document's three to four pages. It's on a template. I didn't mention this, but in resumes, you can't use the words I, my, and me. And that's why you start with action verbs. Usually people put responsibilities included. They don't care about that. Use about the action verbs, developed, you know, managed, addressed, all of those. And some don'ts being too broad with the skills you're trying to mention. <clears throat> now, some effective cover letter tips. I think a common question is, should I write a cover letter? Is it relevant? Does anyone look at them? Sometimes they look at them, sometimes they don't. But I think a resume can be very valuable because a resume, in essence, is the pre-interview. It's a way for you to be able to explain yourself. Let's put it this way. We know that the resume only gets us the interview. It's the interview that decides, are we a good fit for the job? On our resume, we can't show passion. You know, when you go into an interview, the first question they ask you is, hey, why are you interested in the position? Why do you want to work for us? Why are you a good fit? The resume doesn't, it, it mentions these skills, but it doesn't say, hey, I'd be a great fit for Zimmerman advertising because X, Y, and Z. I'm excited about the industry because of blank and blank. I want to make a difference in my community because of X, Y, and Z. It doesn't do that. 
in our cover letter, we can do that. And if they do read it, you've now given yourself a competitive advantage over the other applicants that didn't include a cover letter. And once they've decided they want to bring you in for an interview, even if they didn't read your cover letter at first, they are going to read it before the interview. And that already gives them almost assumptions as to your candidacy and your fit. And it can go a long way to explain either gap of employment, how you align with the company industry, your fit, the projects. You know, in the cover letter, in the introduction, again, it's letting them tell, you could tell a little bit about yourself. Please accept this resume and attach, or please accept this letter and attached resume for the graphic design internship at Puma Industries. I'm excited about this opportunity because always having a creative mindset, I was drawn towards an opportunity that not only I could use my graphic design skills, but work with a company that has such a great culture and a passion for diversity and being able to use creative mindset in a variety of projects. After reviewing the opportunity, I was immediately drawn towards X, Y, and Z. Based on my experiences, academic and professional, I feel that my X, Y, and Z skill sets would be an ideal fit for this position. See how I meant that introduction? I was able to not only give them an overview, I could have mentioned I'm a, I'm a recent graduate in my master's in you know, composition, rhetoric, and digital media. Introduction is like me answering, tell me a little bit about yourself and why you're interested. In the body, I explain, you know, when you go into an interview, they tell you, so what do you think, tell me, what do you think you need in this position to be successful? In the body, in the cover letter, you can say that. I understand that to be a successful graphic design intern, you need knowledge on blank and blank. You need experience with X, Y, and Z. And then you explain the why behind that. And then you go into, these are all experiences I have developed through past uh, positions and academic projects specifically, and then you go into those details. The closing is like wrapping it up. Like, I'm excited about this opportunity. You know, I look forward to hearing from you and possibly meeting for an interview and then restating your contact information. Now, the power of networking, and I'll go through these slides quickly, but again, 80% of the jobs we find are through networking. So attending career fairs, whether you go to Handshake, and I provided some other, Career Echo, JobFairsIn.com, National Career Fairs. Um, these are all different websites that you can find national or local career fairs available to you. I do recommend joining professional groups and organizations. Sometimes they have very specific job boards and using your student access is important because joining some of these organizations sometimes costs like $50 when you're a student and those fees jump a lot more once you graduate. Now your interviews. We're in the final steps of you getting the job. You get called in to show your applicancy. Before you go in there, do your research. Know about the company. Don't just assume you're a good interviewer. Even the best interviewers can falter on this. Ask yourself, and I know interviews can be scary because you could think, well, they can ask me anything. What? And so if you do your research, you can pinpoint what they're going to ask you. So look at the job description and ask, if I was hiring for this job, what are some potential questions? Like, how would you go about this project? Or tell me about how you work effectively on a team. Can you tell me about a time you were working with a client and they were upset and you had to defuse the situation? Why are you excited about the job? What are your strengths and weaknesses? <clears throat> what have you learned about our company? Do your homework. And how do you make a strong impression? Storytelling. Don't just say, oh, I'm a, I'm, I'm a good fit because I have great communication skills. I'm a problem solver. I'm a creative mindset. Give the examples. Don't just say it. Show it to me. Since the beginning of time, guys, there's been people in front of a campfire telling stories. And now we have Netflix. We have Amazon Prime. We love stories. Humans, we're drawn to it. Whether you like to read books, watch TV shows, storytelling is ingrained in us. It's like what we're drawn towards. 
It's also to make ourselves stand out because anyone, you could have five interviewers come in and say they're creative, but it's the person that goes back and is able to expand on and explain a specific example of how they were creative, how they develop all these different things that show me instead of just telling me. And the tone and pace of your voice goes a long way in the interview. Show excitement when you need to show excitement. Slow down when you need to explain something carefully. Be able to really get the attention of the interviewer by how you explain yourself, making sure you're not talking way too fast and it's hard to follow along. Even myself, as I've gone through this presentation, although I've had to cover a lot, my tone and pace has changed as I've really wanted to hit home on certain topics. It's okay to be nervous, but it's not okay to not have passion. If you go into an interview and you're nervous, and then on top of that, you don't show any excitement and passion, why would they call you? At the end of the day, you want them excited about who you are as an applicant. You can't do that if you're just monotone voice and I guess so, and you're not really being specific. Get them excited about you. Half the time, everyone they bring in can do the job. The final step is, are you passionate about the brand? Are you passionate about what you do? And that can go a long way to getting them to buy into your applicancy. Have questions prepared for them at the end. What are the most immediate projects I'd be working on? Can you describe the company culture? What are the key qualities you're looking in candidates that can make them successful? Practice interviews, meet with a friend, family, and go through situational questions, your positive qualities, your shortcomings. And for your positive qualities, provide an example. For your weaknesses, make sure you give an example on how you're working on that weakness, like public speaking skills or other skill sets. Now, make sure you don't choose a weakness that hinders you from the job. Like if you're working on teams and you say your weakness is, you know, I don't like working with people so much. That's going to be a hard weakness to overcome, but it's a real weakness. They don't want people to say, oh, I'm a perfectionist. No, the reason they're asking you your weakness is because they want the type of person that can self-assess themselves identify an area they need to work on and show examples on how they've taken active measures to work on such things. But there's a variety of different interview questions that by doing a mock interview in our office, we can help you review, we can go through it, we can help you prepare strategically. And then finally, negotiating your salary. You know, I have some websites here that can help you do some market research, salary.com, Job Seeker Salary Calculator, Glassdoor. And these are like, especially the Job Seeker Salary Calculator, it's going to have you pull up what your degree is, what school you went to, the area you're job searching, your years of experience. Use all three sites. Now, you should never bring up salary until they've made you an offer. Like asking about salary in the interview is like saying, I love you in the first date. It's like, like, let's see we're compatible before we get into all that. You need to build a relationship with the company. Now that company may ask you early on. So even though you're not going to bring it up, you need to have a number in your head going into even the first interview. You're not going to mention unless they ask you, but sometimes companies like, so what are you looking to be offered in this position? Anytime you get asked that, you say, you know, well, I've done my homework and based on my experiences and my education, you know, I have a number in mind, but I'm curious as to what you're looking to offer this position. You play one game of tennis with them. You hit the ball back. Now, if they take that and say, yeah, well, we really want to know what you were worth. And so then you got to answer it, but you don't want to just come up with a number off the top of your head. You want to have an average based on location because what a marketing manager or communication specialist is getting paid in Miami might look much different than California, New York, North Carolina. Cost of living and all that, it, it, it fluctuates. So you want to have a salary range, anywhere from five to $7,000. So saying, well, you know, based on my years of experience and my research, you know, I'm looking anywhere from 50 to 55, 57,000. Now, be prepared that they say, Perfect. Well, you know, we're going to make you an offer 50,000. You can't be like, actually, no, you know what? I meant 55. That's like, that's it. You gave your number. Now, again, you only want to bring this up when the employer brings it up 
or you're making, you're being offered a, an official offer for it. This, just remember that it's okay to have this uncomfortable conversation, but it's great to have it once they've made you an offer, because at that point, they went through like 200 resumes. They brought 10 people to interviews or more. Out of that whole pool, they thought you were the best and they wanted you. Now, you don't want to negotiate yourself out of that offer, but you want to know what you're worth. And so these, these salary, these websites can help you kind of negotiate that. Now, if they go under that, that's when you need to, you know, assess based on the benefits that I have, the location, all these other things that come into an offer, is it still the right fit for me? <clears throat> and our office can assist you with this. Again, Center for Academic and Professional Success, whether it's our advising team, um, our employer relations team, we're here to support you. We work hand in hand to help you in the job and internship search. We help you with your resume and cover letter, giving you career advising tips, which includes creating a strategic action plan from everything I discussed today. You can schedule an appointment by calling our front desk, 954-262-7990. They can also set you up for a drop-in appointment, or you can log into NSU Navigate and set up an appointment online. But this is all for you guys. You know, the job search is difficult. Internships are difficult. When you have people in your corner, it always helps. But know that this is going to be a job on its own. It's not just going to be like, oh, I clicked and applied. I'm good to go. You got to be proactive and retroactive in the job search at the same time. So, guys, I have just a few minutes for questions, but, um, you know, any questions or feedback on what I covered today? How long do you have access to LinkedIn Learning? Um, I, that's a good question from the Alvin Sherman Library, but I believe while you still currently have your student access, you have access to LinkedIn Learning, because um, I'm not 100% sure um, if it's available for alumni as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Guys, this was recorded. So any, you know, this is also going to be available for you afterwards. Anthony, you had a question? Yeah, I do actually. Um, what would be considered a good weakness of sort? I know you touched on that earlier in the interview. Yeah. Um, public speaking skills, or sometimes, you know, you get too immersed in your own job. Like for example, me, I, I love what I do. And I think you notice it in my tone, but that also comes with me always wanting to take my work home with me. And so I've had to do a better job with my work-life balance and being like, you know what? I need me time. As much as I'm passionate about what I do, I need to be able to separate work and my personal life, take more vacations um, and not feel, not be my own worst critic when I do take that time off. And so sometimes that weakness can be honest things that we all deal with because if we love what we do and we love what we are, that doesn't mean that we still can't give ourselves a mental break from doing what our passion areas are in the work life. Thank you. Oh, I do have a question. Yeah, Danielle, please. Yes, so I had a job sent over to me by one of the faculty members um, it was posted on LinkedIn, but it did not have a lot of description behind it. Like I went to the company website and I know we talked about like jobs that had like way too much description, how to organize that, yep. but how do you go about something that it looks like you may be interested in, but they just don't have a lot of information up for it. So this is, uh, give me mm -hmm. one second. So Danielle, for something like this, you want to make sure that, um, that you can think about the position title and what it might look like for them. And by pulling up other job descriptions that have similar titles and just knowing what that company does, you can then read between the lines like, OK, if I'm going to be a communication specialist for this company in this industry, although these are in different industries, what are some tasks they're going to have me do? What's currently their social media presence? What's currently, you know, 
being able to understand that that position is similar, it just might be different by the industry it's in. So um, I think really sometimes these job descriptions are broad, but pulling up others that are more detailed helps you conceptualize what that position really entails. I didn't have As I know, we hit one o'clock. Um, it's been great being able to speak to everyone and uh, give these insights. Again, uh, the PowerPoint is going to be shared with everyone, has my contact information, anything you need in your own career. I'm here to be an advocate for your career, to send your resume to hiring managers. I also will be honest when your resume needs work and things that you can do to enhance your job search. Uh, but that's why we have an entire advising team to support you through this process. So I appreciate everyone joining us today. And again, anything you need from me, I'm always helpful and I'm always happy to assist you in getting to the next level of your career.